Okay, even up. Okay, let's switch the audio and then. Mm-hmm. Audio. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the channel. We're super happy to share our episode six, Indigenous Lives Matter. And it is an honor to get to know the native first people of this territory, the Duwamish and the Coast Salish people. But, you know, I think with uh, the kind of colonial violence and history that native folks have faced, indigenous people, they, um, you know, I think there's a lot of unity and harmony uh, amongst a lot of coastal people, all the way from up to Alaska and a lot of natives, um, I guess they kind of, uh, you know, work and live together as a community because of the kind of struggle they face and the commonality in this shared culture. So, you know, I'm super honored and grateful to native folks because I think for my own personal self and experience, I think if it wasn't for native people, I wouldn't realize that I too was an indigenous person and, uh, going to ceremony with them and being a part of their spiritual journeys and their work it really allowed me and taught me to um, uh, really value my own culture and my own heritage. And so, um, you know, I'm super honored to highlight some of the guests and the people that are working um, uh, as native cultural workers and artists. And so our very first person we um, were super happy and proud to introduce is Charlotte Penn. And um, I met her through Greenpeace and through some activism and work. And then again, I met her again through uh, Peace and Dignity Journeys, which is this really amazing uh, spiritual journey that Native folks have undertaken in North and South America. It was a prophecy of an eagle and the condor that when these two came together, it would usher forth a new era of peace and prosperity for indigenous people on Turtle Island, which is um, what North America and South America are called. Um, and so, the eagle represents North America and this condor represents South America. And so every four years, runners go all the way from the northern tip of Alaska and run from tribe to tribe. And um, uh, indigenous tribes run all the way from uh, the southern tip of Chile and they meet in the middle at uh, Panama. And the north represents, you know, so they are really fulfilling that prophecy and connecting their communities, their culture, and they run with prayers. And their whole mission is to bring peace and dignity to, to all people and to all of life. And so anyways, I won't go too much more into it, but Charlotte is just this incredible voice and heart and worker for her people and her tribe. She's from the Quileute. And so without further ado, please enjoy her interview that we got to do on Zoom because they're, um, they're, they're closed right now due to COVID. So you know, fortunately, we're able to connect over Zoom. So without further ado, please enjoy Charlotte Penn. First of all, Hachichokdia, you know, that means good afternoon. My name's Charlotte Penn, and i um, born and raised here for the, in Quileute. So my paying job, I work for the Victims of Crime program here at the Quileute Tribe, under the Quileute Tribal Court. Um, and it's, it's um, I think the title's deceiving because um, we were able to secure our grants on what we do for our community. So like community healing, how can we help um, individuals that are a victim of, of something that happened in their life? How can we help support their healing? So, um, you know, and Canoe Journeys is a big part of that. Um, canoe Journeys, I do, I've been, I've been on and um, helping in Canoe Journeys since 1988 before it even hit in 1989. And I can almost recall everything that we did, you know, a long time ago, the whole kill the Indian, save the man thing, you know, hit hard for us people. And um, our our tribal people were losing their identity and all the other stuff. And my grandma Lillian, who I was raised by, my great grandma Lillian Cohen, was a big part of revitalizing our um, culture and our identity for the Koyuk people. And traditionally, a long time ago, for some odd reason, women aren't supposed to sing or, you know, be the boss. But if you think about it, the grandmothers are our bosses. So she was our grandmother. She she sang the songs. She um, revitalized. She, you know, she rebirthed it, basically, because we never really lose it. It's already there. 
so that's a big part of my upbringing and um, part of my identity is carrying on what she taught us, whether it's our culture, our religion, our work, our life, basically how to be a good human being. You know, we have big shoes to fill and a lot of the teachings is like, you can't, you know, you can't have all that stuff in you. Like you can't, you can't be the teacher of everything. I started running with Peace and Dignity Journey since 1994, I think. But before that, I think it was in 92 was when AIM was like doing their movement of running community to community with Russell Means. And I did that uh, with Russell Means. He came to La Push and I ran from La Push to Lower Elwha or so, however far I can go. And I think that was it. I just went to Elwha because I was just a little kid then. So my grandparents and parents were like, no, you can't go. <laughs> what are you trying to do? You can't go anywhere. <laughs> so I've been real passionate about movement for basically my whole life. Um, and that brought peace and dignity journeys into my life. A long time ago, our old people, our waterway was, our, our way of transportation was our waterway. We were surrounded by nothing but water. So, um, back in 1980s, you know, um, Oliver, he had this idea of like, well, how can the Native Americans, how can the first people of, you know, our um, indigenous people be honored in this 100 centennial um, celebration in Seattle? And, um, he got together with a few individuals and um, a lot of people didn't like the idea because, well, you know, like I said, a lot of our traditional um, upbringing and stuff was, you know, was fading away with the whole kill the Indian, save the man thing. thing. And um, my grandma Lillian and, and a few other leaders were like, yeah, let's do it. And so tribes got together and put canoes, built canoes that have never existed in years other than fishing, you know, we only fished with little river canoes. They were like, wow, so we have to build a, we have to build ocean water canoes and they haven't been built in years, like big traveling ones. Um, so that started the um, first year of <clears throat> canoe journeys and so um, the next canoe journeys wasn't until four years later, 1989, 1991, 93, where we all went to Bella Bella, Canada. And then, um, years after that, and today it's still going on due to the pandemic that we're all living in this, this previous year and next year's canoe journeys has been put on hold because, you know, we're, we're very limited we're very limited people, so we're doing our best we can to, you know, keep our elders and our children safe because our elders are, you know, our elders and our children are our future. So we have to keep them safe as much as possible. So canoe journeys still goes on and it's something that um, we all come together and share our songs and stories and dance and um, potlatch and all that stuff. Um, all that good stuff together. So, and the way I describe peace and dignity journey is it's the same way as water, as canoe journeys. It's instead of water, it's on foot. So, peace and dignity journeys, we do the same thing. We go community, community. We offer our songs and dance and prayers. And that's the same thing we do with canoe journeys. We offer our song, dance, and prayers. So, goes hand in hand. Peace and dignity journeys was, um, brought upon um, elders from the like Mayan culture and um, all these different, um, you know, people of big backgrounds that they had. They had a um, vision of North and South America coming together to unite all our indigenous people. And so that's the eagle represents the Northern the northern people, which is all of us, all the way up to Alaska and the condors, all the way to Quito, Ecuador, and you know, reuniting everyone. The the unity of all of the indigenous people coming together is just so powerful. We had the biggest votes in Arizona. You know, the um, the Indian people in Arizona. You know, they carried a lot of votes, and 
you know, it kicked Trump out. So <laughs> we're like, yeah, so, you know, just that little power of, of how much we have. Just imagine if we all come together, how much we can accomplish. And that's kind of the goal of Peace and Dignity Journeys is reuniting us all and how powerful we can be when we all come together in prayer, in action, in um, whatever it is, however it is we can come together, just how awesome it will be. We can change the world. And, you know, that's kind of like the goal of it all is how can we come together in a good way to help each other out? I've always been raised by our elders, so they were like my best friends. And so being with them all the time, I had, you know, I had a good upbringing. I had like, I had great role models to look up to and look after. And I feel like, like that kind of set a precedent for me to be a good person. Like I know what's good and I know what's bad, no matter what my circumstances were in life i know how to be a good person and i feel like that gives me a goal to be a good person and to raise good human beings and i feel like with every step i do in my life like i'm making that step for my children because i have two kids that i raise and i'm a foster mom i feel like i always have to set a good example because i didn't always have good examples while i was growing up i wasn't always with my grandparents so i lived you know a life on eggshells for most of my life but then after i realized like you have the power so after i was like 13 years old i had the power to change my life and change my brothers and sisters lives and take stand for that um so that's really powerful for me to like grow up at the age of 13 I'm like I'm done so um I I feel like I've been like trying to lead a good example like accomplish hard goals in life like going to college and being a single parent graduating getting full-time jobs like I don't have just one job I have many jobs life is precious and it, we can lose it every day or you know any time of the day we we're not promised today, we're not promised tomorrow, so we have to live it the best we can each day. And, um, you know, our grandparents taught us that, and so they have to, you know, they say you got to be thankful to the Creator, to whoever it is that, you know, you are um, you look up to as spiritually or culturally, and um, thankfully I was blessed, you know, religiously and culturally with, you know, our tribal, or indian religion and tribal culture so um i grew up um when our culture and tradition was booming when it was almost lost and then every day was something we had to do it and so um that is that to me is like that's everyday life like you know we have to sing a song saying thank you and it, my daughter sings all the time our tribal songs and um, you know I'm very thankful for that because you know like I said before we weren't a lot like women and girls they they weren't allowed to sing so they were told you know you don't sing too loud or don't start the song men are supposed to start it but then we're like well if we weren't supposed to, we're, if we're not supposed to sing or any of that how is it going to be carried on family to family or child to child and all the other stuff so that's something that we have to incorporate in everyday life for it to carry on and if we don't do it who else is going to do it so it's kind of something that you know was given to us day after day to remember that you know it was taken from us a long time ago but now you know nobody can take it from us anymore so we have to keep it going um you know, we were taught everything has life, you know, the water, the soil, the food that we eat, it all comes from a plant and plant has life in it. So you have to give thanks to everything, literally, you know, our air, you know, oxygen comes from our trees and we're surrounded by nothing but trees here. So everything has a teaching to us. And um, if nobody says anything about it, then who's going to Who's going to know about it? So, you know, just like schools and stuff, a lot of schools aren't taught about us, that we're, we're really here. We're Quileutes and we don't come from the Book of Twilight or nothing, that we're a real tribe and we've been here forever. 
we're trying to catch up with the times on how can we teach our homes, our families, Quileute language, how they can learn, not how our old people learned because times have changed. You know, all of that stuff has, you know, been forgotten. So how can we revitalize that into every family's home? So that's a big thing for us is how can we access more broadband or bandwidth or internet services? We're very limited here. So that's a huge barrier for us. Some kids go to public school, some kids come to tribal school. So it's like hard trying to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, give everybody the same thing. We want, we want everybody to learn the same thing. We have curriculum. We're building um, curriculum for teachers to share it in everyday classroom. But because of COVID and everything, that has put a huge damper on that. Um, so we have the materials. We have everything. It's just how are we going to access it? Like, are we going to make language apps? Are we going to make language games and all the other stuff? And I'm kind of on sitting in, you know, as one of the potential like language learners, but we don't have, we don't have a lot here on our reservation that, you know, um, we'll be able to access basically, you know, we have some fluent speakers, but many of the, many of them were old people and they've, you know, passed on quite some time ago, but we have videos, we have tapes, we have everything, and we have a professor, a linguist, and all the other stuff, you know, that have lived with our old people a long time ago, who is 81 now. So he's like, come on guys, I want you guys to learn it as much as you can before I die, basically. And so, and that barrier right there is funding. We don't have the funding because language grants are so high right now, they're a big commodity, and, they only, you know, grant a couple here and there. Start a camp too. Okay. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to the channel. Uh, that was a really great interview with Charlotte. And you know, she uh, really embodies her indigenous values and being one of the few, you know, there's only a couple hundred Quileute alive, you know, and to carry on that culture and those lessons and, you know, kind of be in the middle where she supports her elders and supports the youth and tries to really um, support her culture is, is not an easy task, you know? And so I have so much respect and love for her and, you know, the native community really, um, I don't know, I think in many ways helped me find my own voice and my own sense of identity too. So. Um, so now our next guest, uh, Marcus Joe, he's, he has a pretty unique story. He was born and raised in Seattle. Uh, he's from the Swinomish tribe, I think, as well as uh, maybe a few others. Um, and he grew up around like hip hop here, but he was saying like, he's like the only native guy, you know, in, in the circle growing up. And as he got older, he really wanted to connect back to his culture and move back to the reservation and really brought the hip hop arts with him. And, um, yeah, he's, he's uh, a really great artist and he's so multi-talented. He does music, he produces, he does graffiti. Um, you know, he definitely supports the young people in his tribe. And so we're super happy and honored to have him come down in studio and share his, his newest track, both an old track and a new track and from, from unreleased, unreleased work. So without further ado, Please enjoy uh, Marcus Joe and his uh, really, really amazing in studio performance. From the people of the Spanish, old plans and markers, go house away with bands, hard sense for focus, in the spirit of the topics, we'll turn back to the stretches. Spread to all my people to the left and learn the stretch, and if you know the five, you can get it. Since they appear from the parents, British shorts, with the freaks in the rear, conquest, the army, the temple, the learners, psychological games, and the miraculous targets. You remember us to cattle in the days of the market, in the time of the fourth, fourth, and first, good, and trust it down, and it finds a declaration of independence, backed by a Representing, for all mankind, just breaking by the with the blood of the victim who's in the head. Now we come to the universe, we're trying to seven generations. 
the verse from our point to stand and rock. Out burning the shell and point, no, you ain't sitting out of travel, burning through the night. Why the fuck is it continuing to like the mother earth? Tell the truth and joy, every boy you earn some work. Every meal and box that hurts, every boy writes the earth. Lord, the monkeys burn the earth, that's why the fuck is it to work. The dirt cleans the corn, rip the fields to the sky. Send it up, crowd right below where King goes by. We're not going anywhere, you can't get it driven, but we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Welcome back. You know, that was Marcus Joe. He's a really incredible MC. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, for some reason, we didn't get to do the second song, but we'll, we'll try to put it out later. But you can definitely check out his work, uh, Marcus Momentum. Um, our next guest on the show is uh, someone who I have so much respect for as well, Sarah Sense Wilson. She's the executive director of UNEA, which is the Urban Native Education Alliance. And she runs Clear Sky. She's a volunteer, she's a community member. She does a million, wears a million different hats and you know, definitely goes over, above and beyond to support urban native youth. And um, I also got to give a shout out to Davida Ingram because not only is she an incredible artist and just beautiful, genius human being, but she also really uh, introduced me to Sarah and brought me on a, on a group project with Lincoln Springs. And so um, you know, I really got a shout out to her for just having like, you know, just a real heart for people and community building. And, really trying to bring our differences and our strengths and our cultures together. So, um, you know, over the last year or so, I've gotten to know Sarah more and more. And I just have, you know, so much respect for how she both advocates for her community and speaks truth to power, but also just is really just willing to be there for, for the young people. And she continues to bring in different experiences, different artists, different cultural workers, different leaders to continuously give um, Native 
a youth a voice and a place as well as access to their culture and so um you know it's crazy to live in seattle named after chief south uh when you know the history is that he wasn't even allowed to come into the city that he was named after him you know and to have to be on stolen land to, to not honor these treaties it's like like what does it really mean to have justice when this violence is continuing you know and so you know i think for me when i think about why indigenous lives matter and why this episode is involved in this um you know museum programming with the seattle asian art museum seattle art museum and the office of arts and culture it's because i feel like without understanding the indigenous story without understanding the indigenous perspective and having a real relationship and and understanding of the local indigenous people i think many people are actually set up to reproduce and recreate that kind of colonial violence and so um instead of uh, ignore being ignorant and repeating the violence, you know, we can be more aware and, and understand the richness and make sure that we create a future that honors indigenous lives. Uh, cause at the end of the day, we're all indigenous too. You know, we all come from a culture. Um, so anyways, I have a lot of respect for Sarah. I've learned so much from her. Any opportunity I have to help her. I don't even have to ask what it is. I'm just down to help her. Um, so without further ado, please enjoy this really great interview we had with her and give a little shout out to Gia Tran who works with Clear Sky and edited this segment. Uh, so please enjoy Sarah Sense Wilson of UNEA. My name is Sarah Sense Wilson and I'm Ogallala Lakota. And my name is, in Lakota is Koki Papeye. So translated, they are afraid of her. The so UNEA is a nonprofit, native led, student centered, grassroots volunteer-based organization. <laughs> I make sure to put all those pieces in because I think that it really is important that people understand um, just how connected we are with our community. Mm -hmm. um, it's We are connected with our community generationally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, yeah. we're over a 12 year old uh, nonprofit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the work that we do with our youth really centers around the four pillars um, of leadership, life skills, language, and um, literacy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so th those are very important to us in, in the work that we do with Native youth. Seattle is a plethora of a, just amazing, amazing, brilliant, genius Native collective. We mm -hmm. have so many people in our community that could be sitting here you know, elaborating and expressing, you know, so much in, mm -hmm. um, in what they do and how they serve our community as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so there, there's, there's a lot of barriers, there absolutely is. And I think that when we look at the dropout rates for Native students in Seattle Public Schools and the um, disciplinary rates and the special ed um, categorization of our kids, there's, you know, there's, just on an onslaught, you know, um, of educational crisis mm -hmm. that is is here in one mm -hmm. of the richest communities or mm -hmm. cities, you know, in in America, yeah, in the world, and yeah, yeah. and in the world. And when we look at the solutions, um, I feel like one of the biggest barriers is that oftentimes the district um, of this public school system is unwilling to cooperate, collaborate, and mm -hmm. work you know, in shared decision making. Yeah, yeah. And um, so when there's such a disconnect between the community and, you know, these decision makers that influence whether or not our kids are going to graduate, mm -hmm. um, you know, there there's conflict. There, there's conflict there. Yeah. It's not just, oh, your your aunt, you know, yeah. but it's 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 a vast network of interconnection with yeah. with family and community and society mm -hmm. and um and i was i'm very fortunate that i was raised yeah, with yeah. that value system you know i often tell people like our home was like a community home mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it served as a shelter a, a soup kitchen mm -hmm. a place of ceremony mm -hmm. um a place of healing uh, there was, you know, in a place of intellectual development and, and discussions, and yeah, there was yeah. there was a lot of room made for that as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how I grew up. Yeah, yeah. That was normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't know any much different. Dang. That's you beautiful. know, that's awesome. 
I, so that's when I say I'm privileged. I know yeah. I'm privileged. That doesn't mean we didn't have mental illness. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there wasn't different levels of, of addiction. Doesn't mean that there wasn't, you know, other other thing, historical trauma, you know, effects. But there was also these other gifts, yeah. you know, that for me, you know, like that was life saving yeah. to have that. So I didn't have those struggles through high school of, you know, dropping out or, you know, like I, I felt very fortunate because I had those inner resources that were, um, you know, gifted to me yeah. by my mom and by my dad. My vision and the vision of our um, youth in um, listening and, and meeting, I mean, we've had so many um, very intentional discussions around education um, is, is for a school, you know, a native focused school, an indigenous school. And not that it's exclusive, not that it's um, native only, um, but a school where we can build community and it will in in where the hub of events and, and gatherings you know can take place there is no place like that in seattle mm -hmm. don't qualify yeah. and um so my vision is that we have this multi-purpose facility where you know there's a you know k through 12 and beyond mm -hmm. partnership with northwest indian college and you know where there is a um you know, connection, a direct connection with the community mm -hmm. and it's community driven, mm -hmm. but youth centered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the Indian Heritage School that it served as a hub for um, ceremonies, for uh, graduations, for powwows, for basketball tournaments, for, you know, art marts. I mean, it, it was, you know, it was the, the, most, you know, useful place of gathering and the fact that it was at Licton Springs, mm -hmm. which we know yeah. since time immemorial, yeah, it was, was a place of um, ceremony, mm -hmm. that there's medicine there and that local Coast Salish tribes would gather there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and have ceremonies and um, rituals and healing practices. So I feel like it's interesting that we were we were drawn there, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and there was already that that connection. Our ancestors were were, were calling us. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandson Waylon, Waylon Riley, mm -hmm. Wilson, Zacchus, Salinas. He has three <laughs> he has three last names. Yeah, yeah, he's the best. He's yeah. he's just every he's everything, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, I think about what the future holds for him and that this is one of the things that keeps me motivated mm -hmm. and and it really drives that desire to have um something good in this community you mm -hmm. know that our that our community can rally around and yeah, yeah. and support yeah, yeah. So, That's beautiful. but we are indebted to the black community you know for the uprising and for their resistance and for their visibility in mobilizing um, nationwide and <clears throat> really engaging um, broader conversations around equity and around justice, and it, it is really powerful. And it's it, it you know um, early on in the movement, you know my uh, you know partner had some health issues, and so we were really um, hunkering down, um, staying quarantined. Um, pretty religiously and so watching media and then watching the gorilla media of like you know Shay and Nikita Oliver and all these amazing people you know it it was it was it, so many emotions and so much you know pain came up and uh and I and I really feel I, I feel that and we owe you know we we owe the black community a lot for that work in the sacrifices and so like um there's so much common ground and there's there's so much <clears throat> that we can relate to mm -hmm. and and so i'm glad that you know our community many people from our community have joined 
you know, Black Lives Matters movement and um, and how it benefits everybody, you know, when we work together yeah. as people of color, you know, all of those, the leaders in, in our community here in Seattle mm -hmm. that, you know, have, again, made those sacrifices and have put themselves on the front lines of, of this, this war, mm -hmm. you know, and it, I, I really do see it as that. And um, it's not, you know, the violence, the corruption, you know, the, um, you know, the mass incarceration that's happening and political um, hostages. It, it's, it's, it's painful and it's, it's hard, it's hard to watch that happen. And so I do, I, I do my part in nurturing our community as best I can and supporting wherever I can. And, um, you know, and I think that it, it's, it's, it's a long haul, you know, it's not just what ha you know, these protests, but it's, it's like what's happening, what's going to happen in the trajectory and, and how do we, you know, like sustain ourselves in that movement and that, that making progress forward. And I do worry that things are slowing down right now, yeah. you know, with um, maybe Mayor Durkin's gesture is satisfying a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it definitely doesn't satisfy, you know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the black community. Yeah. Uh, Finding ways to get grounded and it's so important, I think, that we take that time to recenter ourselves mm -hmm. and to, you know, gather our thoughts and, and just, kind of remember those basics and you know prayer is a big part of my life mm -hmm. and um and I yeah you know whenever I would call my my dad passed away in January <clears throat> and whenever before that whenever I would things I would just feel like we're I couldn't even focus mm -hmm. I would call him and he would just he would often say you know pray pray about it you're gonna be all right you know today's a new day mm -hmm. or tomorrow is a new day you know, just, just pray about it. And, um, or he'll, he would say, you know, I'll roll, I'll roll tobacco and smoke, you know, or I'm going to, you know, we're, we have this ceremony and I'll, I'm, you know, we'll pray for you. Yeah. And that was comforting for me to know that, um, you know, that there would be other people that would be under, or that were sh sh asking yeah, for, yeah. asking for that, yeah, yeah. you know, like, for me. Up yeah. It's much appreciated. Hello, hello. Okay. Sorry about that. We had some technical difficulties. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, so much love and respect to Sarah Sense Wilson for all the great work she does and sharing her perspective. I think it is so important to really understand where we're coming from and to understand the place and the land that we're on, you know. Uh, you know, when we talk about struggles, um, you know, the indigenous people have a very unique perspective that's so important for us to realize now so that we don't continue that kind of violence and, you know, it's getting to the level of like, are we really only going to care about our planet when it affects us, you know? And we've gotten to that level where it's like, yeah, there's, you know, it's, we have, you know, fires and smoke during the summers and, you know, uh, islands, sea levels are rising, you know, islands are disappearing, you know? And so it really is a wake up call. And I think the indigenous people really are, are leading the way of, of what, what is the answer to um, climate, climate issues, you know? Because as stewards of the land, people connect to the earth and the culture, you know, that's, they've been able to sustain a healthy lifestyle for thousands of years 
Whereas Western society has only been around for, you know, a couple hundred and it's already, you know, looking kind of bad for a lot of people now. So anyways, uh, our last guest on today's uh, show and episode is Nahan. And he's this incredible clinket traditional tattoo artist and cultural practitioner. Uh, originally, I reached out to him because I know he does music, I know he dances and he sings, and he's a, he's a leader of his dance group, teaching uh, both his traditional dance, music and dance as well as language. Um, but, you know, we're doing an interview and he wanted to like cut up segments and kind of keep putting out content for everybody and really share and uplift the, I think, important voices that, that really help us expand our consciousness and understand both uh, the importance of, of value our cultural heritage, but also what it means to work for our collective liberation. Um, but Everything he was saying was just so amazing. I couldn't, it was so hard to edit it. So we're just going to kind of play all of it um, and really hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's our last guest for today's show. Uh, so please enjoy Nahan. Um. Uh, Nahan Ayachet, Daksawedi Nahatsiti, Payutka Dekina Yadi Hatsiti, Atasak Dachan Ayachet, Suka Hadika Kagwantan Ayachtakanuku. My name is Nahan. My people are Singit from Southeast Alaska. My father's people are the Kaigani Haida and the Paiute. My grandfather's people are the Anupiak from the Nome area. Uh, I'm going to share uh, some written words today and also some a uh, little bit of flute playing. So this is my father's flute. Ajaway 
ye we cha kuta khwe ya yu khatangi ha shuka has tu da khwe ya ya yu khatangi has tu yu khatangi ya nas akh ya idat ya nas akh has tu tu asgu yi khsikhan a yi khsikhan katla khwasa tu khlake yi ka khan yat kusani a anyat kusani a ya ya akhlil ku has ka akhtat khan kisani ka khtakata ku atlatu has tu tu asgu ya yu khatangi ten ya yi yi ya ya singet ani Dach awe ya ya yu khatangi ha hini ka ha sha ka ha ukja ka ha jenei ka ha ka dai dulkesi ka ha kashkidi stikat at ya yu khatangi tunach ye yeti we ha yu khatangi kunach Kunach yak e awe achewe achewe ya jenei ye ya htu yeti kunachish. What I said was the language of my ancestors is here present today. It speaks through through me and through my teachers and through my teachers' teachers and all the way back. To the rivers and the mountains and the strong winds and the icebergs and the glaciers where my people come from uh, from ancient times we say our language comes from before when the great flood happened around the world our language comes from before the last ice ages we are ancient people we come from this coast here yeah yeah this is how i'm feeling today my grandson would say something like this he would say, everything has a spirit. Our language has a spirit. And that spirit you can communicate with. And so when you communicate to the spirit of your language, then it communicates back to you. And that which is ancient becomes the future. That which is ancient becomes the present. And time becomes more irrelevant. So our language is without time. And so um, this is a part of our culture that we understand and we accept, and we don't uh, we don't doubt it. We don't um, we don't think that um, nothing uh, anything is possible. We don't think anything is impossible. So um, my my grandson would say, um, "You can do anything you set your mind to," and this is something I wanted to remind everybody who watches. Uh, everything is inside you, is what I said. All of the elements of the universe are inside you. They're inside each of us. And so that universal knowledge is like learning from itself. So we are the universe learning from itself. Um, so this is the purpose of my life. This is the purpose of this day this is the purpose of our language to remind each other to remember each other to put each other back together again yeah yeah gonna teach i said be of good courage i love you each and every one of you and i'm proud of you for the work that you're doing and the work that you are going to do have courage along the way we got to work together these are pillars of our of our teachings that we have uh, still in place, that we are born as a human. We are born with the uh, capacity to be intellectual. We have uh, intellectual uh, uh, properties innately flowing through us. We have um, the ability to be still, to learn uh, how to learn. And so from that point, uh, we can come together and work together and achieve what cannot be done alone. Uh, I'm not just speaking about other people, but mind, body, emotions, and spirit coming together. Wu Chin, Wu Chin is what we call that. So these are things I wanted to share today uh, and remind everybody who is going to see this within the within the sound of my voice uh, about this ancestral wisdom that comes from this coast here. Uh, some people say it, our language also comes from the ocean, 
and that the ocean has a memory. And so we want to remind each of you to go and greet the ocean, go and spend time with the ocean and communicate with that big spirit that's out there. There's more uh, ocean than there is land. So, and we are made of the same. So just a reminder of how to put ourselves back together again and remind each other to do that work. Yeah, yeah, gonna cheesh. Yeah, my name is Nahan. Uh, I'm Plinket on my mother's side. Uh, I'm Paiute and Haida on my dad's side, um, but we're matrilineal, so I follow my mom's side, right? So uh, my grandfather is Inupiaq. I was born and raised here in Seattle. And um, yeah, I do a lot of different things, I guess. Uh, I facilitate our language is kind of the one of the primary things I do right now. Um, and we've been doing that for three times a week uh, for the last several months. Um, and before that, I've been working with the language and trying to create that space for it. There's less than 100 fluent speakers of our language nowadays, and most of those folks are over 60. So I'm trying to change that dynamic and make sure that my grandmother's language is uh, spoken across the land. Um, so aside from that, uh, I lead a dance group which is a uh, traditional we have regalia and we do tribal canoe journeys uh, we've been doing that for several years now as well um, i'm involved in carving i helped revive uh, revive the traditional tattoo practice of our tribe so i've been doing that for the last decade or so um, and really kind of um, just stepping into the position of being who i needed when i was younger and playing that role for the nieces and nephews that come around really and um, you know just doing the best i can in that regards clean and sober uh, for you know several years now i think 16 years something like that so and i think that's a big statement to my own uh, healing process and my own uh, process of decolonization yeah, so using contemporary tools the modern tools in order to facilitate an ancient language is something that we've had to do. Um, so as soon as Zoom came about, we were like, all right, well, let's figure this out. And that pandemic really kind of pushed us in that direction too. Um, not being afraid to figure out the, those tools and, and apply them towards our language and try to reach people in the way that they learn best, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of our people now uh, have learned from reading and writing and they, they require that structure of, you know, sit down in the classroom, here's the whiteboard, this is the notes you take, here's your pad, your pen, you know, so trying to reach people on that level, but also trying to like shove all of that off the table and be like, let's go into the forest and let's talk about these medicines and let's create this relationship and rebuild our connection to the land. And this is where the language comes from. And so just trying to do that um, is, is really, you know, uh, uh, takes up a lot of time. But, um, you know, when I heard my gram, she told me that her mouth got washed out with soap when she was young for speaking our language. And she was teaching it to me at the time. And I was like, yo, I was like, if that's not the biggest motivator to, to practice this language and bring it forward, like gung ho, I don't know what is. So I've been doing that uh, to rinse that taste of bar soap from my grandmother's mouth. And I think that it heals intergenerationally instead of uh, really trying to focus on the trauma that perpetuates through our generations. If that's a thing, uh, epigenetics is a thing, then we have to apply that in the healing methods too and reach all the way back through the generations, yeah. So, yeah, we've always had the foods around. We've spoken a little bit of the language um, and we've had community, which is the primary part of our, of our culture. Um, but as far as the language and the songs and the ceremonies and, uh, you know, like our way of thought and stuff that came about because my grandmother put me on the spot and she was like, this is what I want you to do. And she said, you're the one that has to do it. So I'm going to teach you. You're going to learn our language. You're going to join the dance group. You're going to, you know, so she, here's the list of things. And I'm just like, grandma said, you know, so. 
Um, it's not like I woke up one day and was like, oh, I think I need to do it. You know, it was just like it all really, she just kind of slapped it on my face and made it happen in a loving way, you know, and I'm really thankful she did that because it allows me to eat, you know, too. Even though she passed away last year, I'm still like, I'm still able to support myself because of what she instilled in me. And I think she knew that. What comes to mind is when people fight for justice, what, what does that essentially mean? And are we, who are we fighting for that justice for? And right now, I think there's a huge push for justice for people, specifically uh, of color, specifically black people. And that's dope. Like we have to support that as indigenous people, as part of us reclaiming what is justice and um, you know, knowing how we have to work together in order to create what we need to see for the future, right? So um, along with that, the, you know, all the different struggles that are embodied socially, economic, economically, politically, should have a grounding um, uh, foundation on the knowledge and acknowledgement that uh, this land is stolen. And, you know, how can you have justice on stolen land? I think about KRS-1s, you know, he has, a, he has some lyrics, he said, uh, and I think it's the sound of the police, that, that track, and he's like, you, there can never really be justice on stolen land. And he acknowledged that back, on, I don't even know, it was like 30 years yeah, ago or something like that. So he, he knew that back then, and he just tossed it in his flow, just all casually, like this heavy, <laughs> heavy thing, you know? And I still think about that, and that's one of the chants that we use uh, as our dance group, as we're, we're marching in solidarity with Black Lives Matter or, um, you know, whatever movement is taking place that we agree with. Uh, we show up and we, we do what we need to do in the way that the folks need us to. And so I think along with that is, is trying to um, not just show up on the front lines, but also in support, you know, in the backside, you know, watch, watching everybody's backs. And then also um, planning for what the future looks like, right? So and that, that for me means our, our language, that for me means our carving, that means our canoe culture, that means our, our way of thought, that means our ceremonies, that means all of the stuff that was around before colonization happened. So for us in Alaska, it was 17, mid 1700s when that happened, which isn't that long ago. So it's a pretty recent thing for, for us to experience and to go into school and be like, oh, this is the, this is the best option for me. Or to be like, you know, literacy only refers to something you read in a book. And if you, if you don't know how to do that, then you're not smart and you're judged by somebody else's, you know, whatever, whatever. For us, it's like if you go through the forest and you don't know anything about any of the plants around, then you're illiterate. If you go to the, if you go to the beach and you don't know any of the foods you could get, then you're illiterate. You know what I mean? So there's, there's kind of a um, cultural difference. For that and so you know the the sharing that takes place uh, through the struggle is is um very much needed and that dialogue that that we have to create and and manifest and keep keep strong throughout the generations is really what what makes the, the movement more powerful so i think about um you know like uh, bob santos and um, um bernie white bear and then you had um larry gossett and then you had uh, Roberto Maestes. Those, those cats are like all different communities, but they still came together and they worked together and they, they were hella strong because of that. And it wasn't just them, it was all the other folks that they supported and that supported them and vice versa. You know, so um, if we look at that example that was set here in the city by those, by those four folks, then we should be doing that just as much here. And we should be doing like we should have had already been past these points by now and and establish certain things and like know who's who and who to talk to and so i think i think that's really important is maintaining that same dialogue throughout the generations and looking at those examples knowing them well we're still here you know what i mean and we are before america we're going to be here after america and so that's not to be an anarchist but that's to be indigenous and we we're we we're here before any of those terms were around 
And so there's a lot of folks who are like, yo, vote, vote, whatever, whatever. And there's a lot of folks who are just not, you know, because we recognize that when we're voting, we're also perpetuating this colonial settler, settler state that that is a, an invasive uh, presence on our land. And so uh, some of us see beyond that and the short lifespan of what is America. And so that uh, foreign occupation is not a healthy presence in our lives. It's not something that benefits us to the extent that um, I think a lot of folks make believe it to be. Uh, so that, that I think is a significant um, kind of difference than, than um, just being sitting back and claiming to be American because it's easy to do that. And the, the, the lifespan of America is what, like last 200 years? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty short lifespan to be claiming all the time. You know what I mean? That's a short lineage, bro. Like, how you ain't been here that long. You're just like, oh, I'm like, come on, bro. Like, we've been here since like 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. We claimed that lineage first. Mm -hmm. And so that, that sort of um, that acknowledgement of, really it's speaking back to the land and the history and and you know knowing our stories aren't just like fairy tales but they're they're our history you know what i mean so we we kept um intact our our oral culture uh, and our listening culture which are very different today so the listening culture we would sit down and sometimes stories would last four days one story four days and you just sit there and listen and then you'd hear it again and again and again until you're able to tell it back so the process of listening is something that our people knew in a way different way than what is today so today is like 30 seconds that's all i got you know 25 seconds on the tv the ad needs to happen in 30 you know five seconds and that's the only way it's going to be effective you know um so the attention span is, is something that uh, needs to be looked at too. And each of us have that, you know, in our, in our history, we all have that ability. And it ain't about like, you know, a meditation or nothing like that. That's just something that's already a part of us, mm -hmm. you know? So um, the, vis the visibility of our people is, is a tough one because, you know, I've been organizing here in Seattle since 2008 to abolish Columbus Day. And we did that shut down the streets you know we um you know occupied whatever whatever for several years and that approach was something that brought our people together all of a sudden strangers became relatives brothers and sisters community is built so um the visibility is an interesting thing because on one hand it's like yeah we're here and we're gonna do this but then at the other hand there's also folks who are predators who are taking making targets out of us mm -hmm. right so i think about the the women's march up in vancouver where they they've been doing that for like 30 years brought about way lots of um a whole lot of uh, awareness about missing and murdered indigenous women and missing and murdered indigenous people uh, which is a huge epidemic um, and so alongside that Though there were these predators who were like, as soon as that march is over, they're grabbing people and taking them in the in the vans and shit. So that I mean, that story is real. So it's like, it's like how much is visibility really positively affecting us, and versus how much is it really like not positively affecting us. So um, it's it's a it's a tough balance, you know, and and to just to know that as as indigenous people. You know we're we're in a in a tough situation on a lot of the different statistics and everything like that in the prisons and and whatnot so i mean it's i think really the main thing would be that um we don't always have to be like the wise uh indians that yeah. sing the songs and show up and do the welcoming for everybody else the tokenism you know gets gets kind of tiring but then also like don't trip out when we be like off the government, you know what I mean? Because it's not our government, you know? So just, just that dynamic, you know?
yeah. I just think that working together is a big thing um, and figuring out how to problem solve. And because our ancestors have been through, you know, disagreements for how many generations we've worked through those disagreements. We've worked through different points of view. We've worked through mistakes, people making, uh, making uh, issues and handling those issues in a, in a positive, uh, creative way. How do we problem solve like that? And so, you know, instead of um, the lateral bullshit that often happens in our communities, mm -hmm. being able to be like, well, let's laterally heal. Like, how do we do that? Let's like, we're so smart, right? Why don't we do that for a minute? Let's sit down and be like, how do we heal laterally? Like, how do we love laterally? And it ain't, it ain't about intimate, romantic kind of stuff. I'm talking about like legit brother, sister, auntie, uncle, you know, straight across. How do we do that? So, um, and then recognizing if, how, how our uh, own energy is being used. So are we, are we abusing our own energy? Are, uh, are we allowing somebody else to abuse it by harvesting our essence for five days a week, nine, nine hours a day? I don't know. It's, it's an interesting kind of um, thing that I think there's, there's many levels that we can look at. And I think really that um, uh, when you take the time to uh, listen to what what was practiced a long time ago, then uh, you'll be able to tell the future, right? So when you know the past, you'll be able to tell the future. And there wouldn't be any confusion about how that should be done. Um, so, I mean, yeah, for each of us, that might be a different thing, but we each hold part of that fire and each hold uh, part of those elements that are needed for the future mm -hmm. to be what it needs to be. And uh, just giving, giving the youth the opportunity as well, being like, it don't matter how old this person, if they got something to say, let's give them that microphone. Let's give them that stage. Let's give them that platform. Let's give them those tools. Let's give them everything we got. Because if that's going to give them that, that, that shine, from that point forward, it's just going to amplify. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be like way further along than like, you know us sitting sitting here together you know what i mean they're going to be already out there doing stuff and so um you know i just think about that empowering the youth uh honoring the land um honoring the the sacred you know all those different parts that are um different ways that our people fight uh the colonial system be it through pipeline resistance or um you know, language activism or community building or um, mutual aid, you know, those, those different sorts of things where we can step away from the colonizer middleman and be like, this is us. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I have this like food I can give you right now yeah. and you can share with me this story. And then all of a sudden we don't need this, this white man, dead president in our pockets coming between us to make it legitimate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that those are all steps that are relevant to uh, reclaiming who we are and who the future needs to be. So, so. A couple ideas anyway. Yeah. So, you know, thank you so much for joining us. Episode six, Indigenous Lives Matter. You know, Nahan, he had some amazing words of wisdom. I'm so inspired by all the examples today that show how indigenous lives matter, how their perspective is not only something that's relevant to our lives, but absolutely needed to understand. You know, sometimes I really, as an artist and as community member and organizer, I really think about what does the indigenous future look like where black lives matter? And, you know, how can we, you know, um, come together through all our differences without forgetting who we are and still valuing things that um, that we all share in common, you know? And so I think the fact that we all depend on the earth for the air, the water, the food that we eat, all the material things that we have, you know, that sacred relationship that we've had with the earth is um, it's so valuable. And, you know, indigenous people where we all originally came from, 
you know, they figured out a culture and a way of life that really honors that, where it's not this like extra thing. It's actually just part of our life that we just honor our relationship with nature because we know that essentially it's nurturing us in our lives. Um, so I really hope you enjoy the various perspectives from Charlotte, you know, from Marcus Joe to Sarah Sense Wilson to Nahan. And definitely want to give a shout out to all the folks listening. Uh, Regina, Laura, Lena, you know, Sarah, um, Naomi, uh, other folks. So thank you so much for tuning in. Please definitely share. And um, I also want to give a special shout out to our partners. We have the Seattle Asian Art Museum, Seattle Art Museum, the Office of Arts and Culture, Right here, we're shooting at Blue Cone Studio, Carolyn Hint, and Pound Studios, Pound Gallery, Pound Arts with um, Laura Jean Cronin and, you know, the whole Future Ancient team. Uh, let's go to a little BTS shot. Um, we got our team right here. You guys can wave, y'all, you know. <laughs> oh, it's right here. It's right here. And then, uh, man, let's go to let's go to Cam 1. So um, we have a very special guest. Tara, uh, she flew in from LA, and uh, we're so honored to have you here. Looks you want good. Yeah. <laughs> little Lotus in the house. It's a little chilly, but it's all good. I'm here for you, Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> we're honored to have you here. Thank honored you to bring your Cambodian ancestors and culture to us. And yeah, you're going to be featured on our season finale. So, Yay. Um, Thank yeah, you so much day. for having me. We're honored. We're honored. This is yeah. amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> Everyone on this series is amazing. I'm blessed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're we're blessed you know like it, as as many problems as seattle may have and you know with kind of the wealth gap and the homelessness and all these things like you know we do have a great opportunity for all these different people around the world to come together and share the richness of our culture so i'm super happy excited and honored to work with you and and to our team and everybody so it's my pleasure thank you so much for having me yeah, yeah. Dope, dope, dope. <laughs> thank you all right y'all be safe out there and uh, you know, stay safe, mask up, you know, wash your hands, <laughs> stay, stay indoors. You know, we gotta get through this, y'all. And, and stay uh, warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Peace, Bye. enjoy, have a good night. Bye. Tune in next week for episode seven, Local API Arts. And um, yeah, we got two more episodes this season. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful night, y'all. Peace. Bye. <laughs>